Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody, and most especially Scott here, to share with us uh, information and knowledge and expertise on terrapins, which if I am correct, or if I am wrong, please correct me, is that the state reptile for Maryland? That is a state reptile, yes. All right, well, I am going to go ahead and uh, mute myself, and Scott, you can share your screen and- Okay. Let me remember how to do this. <laughs> there we go. Um, unmute yourself for a second just to let me know that you all can see this. It hasn't switched over yet. Is it up? Is it up yet? Nope. You sure you hit <laughs> Did you hit share? Yes, I did. Let me go back to, uh, let me uh, reduce this. Ah. I hit share screen, I hit share. Hmm, let me, let, me, let me try this again. Share screen, share, and we'll try this again. Can you see that? No. Hello? No, we cannot see that, Scott. Oh no, I thought we had this worked out. We did. We, we practiced before everybody got on. But then we spent so much time trying to, trying to figure the other stuff out. So I'm going to close hmm. out. Can you close out of that? So you said stop share. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think I'm out of it now. And you say so I'm going to hit share screen. Now, the problem is, is it's not. The button that says share is not uh, is not lighting up. It's only can't the only thing. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, we got it. Is that it? We got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to thank the Natural History Society for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, again, my name is Scott Smith. I have worked for the Department of Natural Resources for 31 glorious years. Um, and I'll be nearing the end of my run in a couple more years, but um, I'm still with them. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about Dimeback Terrapins. And I decided I could talk to you about a lot of different things about Terrapins. I've been working with them since 2008. Um, but I decided I really wanted to talk to you guys about some low-hanging fruit, um, a conservation uh, conundrum that I think is very solvable. I think that uh, us together can solve it. Uh, but I kind of want to go through uh, the science behind it. But first, let me introduce you to our our state reptile, the Diamondback Terrapin, Malachlemys Terrapin. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about turtles, um, many of our aquatic turtles have, uh, um, the females are much larger than the males. Um, it's reversed in snapping turtles, but it's, it's uh, in the majority of the other aquatic turtles, our females are much, much larger than the males. So here we have a male up top and a female down below. Um, and, um, as in most of our turtles, sexual maturity is delayed. In females, it's eight to 13 years. In males, it's four to seven years. But they live a long life, um, 45 plus years. Female produces about three clutches a year, 12 to 14 eggs per clutch. And it takes about two and a half months for those uh, eggs to hatch out, uh, depending on a lot of different factors, including wet, primarily associated with weather. Um, and most of those eggs that hatch out, the young will emerge um, in the late summer, early fall, um, and they'll go up into the marsh um, and spend a couple of years up in the marsh. But for about maybe 10 to 25% of the, of the uh, nests, uh, they will overwinter in the nest and they won't come up on the surface until the following spring. So it's almost like we have two different um, uh, influxes of young terrapins into the environment. Um, one of the really cool things about Diamondback Terrapins, and it's true about half of our turtles, they have temperature dependent sex determination. What that means is that the gender of those hatchlings is dependent on the temperature that they're incubated at. For instance, um, if, you, uh, if you were trying to get mostly females, you'd wanna be incubating between 30 and 32 degrees Celsius, and males is 24 to 27 degrees Celsius. And the temperatures in between, you get a mix of males and females. And this has some real implications when we begin to talk about climate change a little later in my talk. Uh, so about half of our 
Half of our turtle species have temperature dependent sex determination. The other half, it's genetic. Um, it's through chromosomes, like bog turtles and wood turtles is totally chromosomal. Terrapins are what we call a molluscivore. They're a carnivore that, uh, that is a specialist on mollusks. In fact, the two main parts of their diet are mud snails and periwinkle snails. And here we see a terrapin foraging among the snails and the, uh, and the, and the uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. They also feed on clams and mussels, in particular soft shell clams and some of the smaller clams and blue shell mussels. They'll feed on a number of different crab species, including blue crabs, Calinectes. They particularly like them when they're soft shelled, as do I. Um, they, they may feed on barnacles. They certainly diet studies have found barnacles in, the, in their diet, but they may be passively um, uh, ingesting them, as has also been uh, suggested for both eelgrass and sargassum. However, a researcher in Virginia in the last couple of years has suggested that terrapins are actually pretty important for dispersing eelgrass seeds around areas of the Chesapeake Bay, which I think is a pretty interesting ecological um, uh, thing they do for us, uh, service they, uh, ecological service they, they do. And of course, terrapins also feed on fish. They're opportunistic like a lot of other turtles, um, particularly on dead fish. Um, I'm, I'm right now uh, head starting a couple of terrapins um, and they seem to really like the fish. I haven't gotten them into the clams and mussels yet or the snails. Um, so terrapins are our only truly estuarine turtle. They can survive in, um, in salinities up to about 30 parts per uh, thousand. Um, and we do have a couple other turtles that you'll find in saline environments like snapping turtles and uh, mud turtles and red-bellied cooters, but they're, they're only in, in low saline and they're only spending a little bit of their time in it. This is the only turtle we have that truly spends all of its time in salt water. So the key habitats for these guys in the Chesapeake Bay and coastal bays are marshes and beaches. The marshes are really important uh, because they produce a lot of food uh, that the, the terrapins feed on but they're really important for the early life stages of the juvenile life stages of the terrapins. Beaches are really important for nesting. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about both of those in a bit. So the range of terrapins in Maryland, again, is the entire Chesapeake Bay, just a little bit north of the Bay Bridge and the coastal bays of Maryland. And then a lot of the tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay, like the Choptank River, um, the Honga River uh, on the Western shore, the Patuxent, and the Potomac, at least up to about the Charles County line. Uh, the big difference between the Herb Atlas results and what Herb Harris published in 1975 is that Herb didn't show that the turtles going up the, uh, Potom the Potomac River very far. Um, and they, they certainly were found um, in quite a few blocks um, in, during the recent Herb Atlas project. Then you'll see these three uh, stra uh, strange oddball locations uh, from the Herb Atlas. We think those are probably released animals. Someone was down on the shore, saw this interesting turtle uh, crossing a road, decided to take it home and then released it. Um, did a really dumb thing, but anyway, so those, those animals are likely not gonna, not gonna survive. Uh, Range-wide, the turtle is found from uh, Massachusetts up near Cape Cod, all the way down to Texas and maybe into Northern Mexico. And there's also a population out in Bermuda. Um, historically, uh, scientists uh, subdivided dimeback terrapins into seven subspecies. Recent genetic work over the last 10 years has really divided them into six genetically determined management units. So there are a lot of threats to dimeback terrapins. Uh, many of these threats are to all other turtles too. There are a few that are somewhat unique to dimeback terrapins because they do uh, reside in this unique habitat in these estuaries. Loss of nesting areas to development erosion is a real problem, and loss of access to those nesting areas through bulkheads and riprap. So here we have a development down here in the right corner. We have a bulkhead being put in. That's gonna completely not allow terrapins to nest up in its former habitat, which of course is gonna be lawn after this is all done. And over in the left-hand corner, we have riprap, and an adult terrapin can certainly climb over this riprap and come up here and nest. The problem is the youngsters cannot navigate over this riprap successfully and get back to the water 
they're going to end up getting stuck in cracks between the rocks and starve or desiccate. So that's a real problem. Um, as with all of our turtles, there are really high nest predation rates um, in terrapins from human subsidized predators. And by that, I mean primarily raccoons. Raccoon populations right now are probably at a historic uh, high. Um, Martian beach loss to sea level rise to climate change is a real problem. And the key thing here is, um, are, is, marsh, is new marsh going to develop as rapidly as it's being lost? And we don't think so. We think the rate of climate change and sea level rise is, is higher than uh, the marsh can't keep up with it. And of course, the, the marsh and beach are critical to the survival of diamondback terrapins. We're also already seeing skewed sex ratios in diamondback terrapins in Maryland, somewhere between four females to every male to nine females to every male. And that's partly due to climate change. Again, if you think about it, at higher temperatures, we see more females, at lower temperatures, more males. So if we have increased solar radiation and soil temperatures in these nesting beaches are higher, these nesting beaches are gonna be putting out a lot more females. Um, the other thing that's also exacerbating the um, skewed sex ratio is drowning in crab pots because that tends to just uh, drown the smaller turtles, the juveniles and the males um, that, that are the only ones, the, the big females can't fit through the funnel. I'm gonna get into that in a lot more detail in a minute. Other threats to diamondback, ter diamondback terrapins include road mortality. This is primarily nesting females. Boat strikes also are primarily females because the females tend to use the deeper water habitats. The males stick close to shore. So it's much more likely a female is going to get hit by a boat. I know uh, one of the studies we did that I'm not going to talk about was down in Somerset County uh, over about three years. We, we caught and marked about 600 terrapins. And um, it wasn't uncommon to see some scars occasionally on a turtle from the uh, boat propeller. And those are the lucky ones. And those are the ones that survive that boat strike. Another real problem that we have with really all of our herps, as all of you folks know, is illegal collecting for the pet trade. Um, at one time, up until 2007, there was a commercial harvest of terrapins in Maryland. And thanks to some of you folks who are listening tonight and a lot of other people, um, the legislature passed a ban on the commercial harvest of terrapins. Uh, that would have been number one on my list here if we still had it but it's been gone since, since 2007. And in fact, when uh, that ban took place within DNR, terrapins were given to my shop in 2008. And that's why I'm now uh, the, the terrapin biologist. Um, and last but not least, drowning in crab pots, both recreational and commercial and other types of commercial gear. So let's talk about that. Um, there was a huge meeting of terrapin researchers down south in, um, in 2006. And the proceedings of that were published. And all those researchers emphatically 100% agreed that mortality due to crab pots is the greatest threat to terrapin populations throughout their range. Um, and I can't, I can't say that enough. And so I'd like to talk a lot about crab pots and terrapins the rest of tonight and talk about some of the survey work we've done and <clears throat> some of the problems we face and perhaps some of the solutions. So let's talk about crab pots. Crab pots are a Chesapeake Bay invention, at least the modern crab pot. It was invented in Virginia, even though we often hear people call it the Maryland uh, crab pot, but it's, it's a Chesapeake Bay crab pot. And it was developed in, in 1928. It was first used as commercial gear in Maryland in 1939, but fairly quickly it was banned by the Maryland legislature because watermen were aghast that it was killing all these terrapins and finfish, all this bycatch um, instead, instead of just crabs. And they were kind of like, what is this thing? It's, it's killing everything. Um, Davis in 1942 was really one of the first people to publish about the problems with terrapins and crab pots. He noted that when crab pots are placed in such localities as creeks, guts, saltwater ponds, and along marshy shores, they capture and drown terrapins. But quickly in 1943, the ban was lifted because regulations were passed that only allowed uh, Crab pot uses, yes. Are you showing pictures of this or are you just talking about the crab pots? Um, can you see, um, are you, can at, you see my screen? Yes, we're still at threats to diamondback terrapins, but I didn't know if you had gone on to another slide. 
Oh yeah, I'm, I'm like two slides in front of that. Right. So you're not. It sounded like that, but. So you're not seeing a, a slide that says crab pots and shows a bunch of dead terrapins in a pot. No, we're still at threats to diamondback terrapins. That's strange. So so somehow it's frozen. Uh, do you, you think I ought to get out of this screen and try to load up again? Yeah, let's try that. Okay, I'm sorry about this, folks. That's okay. Um, we'll blame DNR. So We'll blame DNR. That's right. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try the share again. Okay, we're gonna try the share again. Are you folks ready? Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Can you still still see that? Yes. Okay, so this is the the slide I had in front of me when I was um, when I was talking about crab pots. All righty, so I'm going to continue with this. You can see again up in the upper, here's a, Mar a Maryland type or a modern crab pot that's used now all over the, the country, probably all over the world where there's crabs. And here's a bunch of dead terrapins in a crab pot. Dave Brinker, who many of you know, took this picture um, out at um, Poplar Island um, a few years back in, in Talbot County. Um, I just changed slides. Can you see that it says 1943? No. Hello? No. You're kidding me. Well, this isn't good. There's usually a lag, but it's, I mean, I know it's on the eastern shore, but there shouldn't be that much of a lag coming over. No, there, there shouldn't be any, there shouldn't be any lag. Um, Do you want to go, huh. can you go to slideshow real quick and... Um, let me, let me end the show. Go to slideshow. Um, okay, so go, go to share, you mean? There, there is nothing that says slideshow here. But. Uh, uh, the, yeah. Okay, let's we'll try it again, share it again. It would kind of not be good if we had to do this uh, slide by slide. <laughs> Sometimes if you uh, turn off your video, it gives what, what's it, what's that? Gives you more bandwidth from where you're, where you're showing. So if who turns off, if everybody else turns off their video or if I do? If you do. So you want me to hit stop video? You can give it a shot, yeah. Okay. Let me, uh, let me try sharing again. Can you see my screen? We can. Do you want to go ahead and start? There we go. 19... Okay, do you see it says 1943 band lifted? Yes. Okay. So uh, the band got lifted in 1943. But um, the, uh, the, the caveats they put is that the crab pots were not allowed in bay tributaries or in water less than four feet mean low water. Um, so that four feet mean low water is still on the books. They're, they're not allowed to be used in water shallower than four feet at, at low tide. Now, unfortunately, in 1975, recreational use of crab pots was allowed in the tributaries, which is completely counter to three, three decades before that, the, the thought process on the impact of these crab pots on terrapins and other things. And I have been told this is because someone, um, uh, a, a, someone who was very influential wanted to be able to fish crab pots off their dock and they were able to convince some legislators to change um, the regulations. So anyways, so here we are, we have these recreational crab pots since 1975 being used in the very places where terrapins are abundant. Um, then in 1999, DNR passed regulations which required a turtle excluder or a BRD, which stands for bycatch reduction device, in crab pots that were being used for recreation, not in commercial, but just in recreational crab pots. And there was a specific, specific size, four and a half by 12 centimeter rectangle. Um, I just changed um, slides. Can you see this new slide that talks about Roger Wood? No. You're kidding me. Okay, let's give it another second. Well, this is certainly frustrating. Another reason why not to live on the Eastern shore. No, um, <laughs> so I'm going to get out of this. We may, I think uh, for every slide, we may have to do this. I hate to say it. Well, um... 
can you, I mean, if, if people will, will hold on a, 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 a quick second, you could email me the, the presentation and I could put it up and see if that works. Okay, why don't we try that? If people don't mind holding on for a second, let me- um... Hold on, people. All right. I think we are now going to be cooking with butter in just one second. <laughs> this is what we should have done as a, a to begin with, you know. Hindsight oh, being twenty twenty. Right. We were getting too too confident in the Zoom technology, so. All I right. wasn't. Believe me. All right. So um, the bycatch reduction device was first developed in 1992 by Dr. R Roger Wood in New Jersey over at the Wetland Institute, which is in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. If any of you folks get a chance to go over to Cape May County, I'd suggest you check it out. It's a, a pretty cool place. And um, so he he developed one that was a, wire, a metal wire one. And you can buy, um, when you go to look for these things, there are metal wire ones there are, and there are plastic ones. Um, you can make your own also, as long as it's the, the correct dimensions. Uh, next slide, please. So the, um, the bycatch reduction device or ter terrapin excluder used in Maryland is based on research that Willem Rosenberg uh, did and published in 2000 that DNR funded his research. And he, he looked at all different kinds of sizes of BRDs and this four and a half by 12 centi centimeter one uh, reduced terrapin bycatch by 82% with no effect on the number or size of crabs. So um, really only the smallest terrapins can get in there and that's about as good as we can get, and that's what the state went with. Um, this same size has been used by other states, though some states are using a different different sizes. Um, and ours are um, are put on the on the funnels um, horizontally. Some other folks have tried vertical with different type uh, different amounts of success. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so that all happened in 1999. Well, Radzio, who was, who was one of uh, Willem Rosenberg's um, associates, did a study in the Patuxent River back in 2005. They wanted to look at compliance. How many people actually had these turtle excluders on their crab pots? And they found that only a little bit over 26% of them had it on it. And they recommended that recreational crab pots be sold with the, the turtle excluders, the BRDs already installed. But they also noted that they needed to expand the geographic scope of their study since they were just doing it in one area on the Patuxent River. Next slide. So in step DNR, um, in 2009, we began a study that had three main objectives. One, we wanted to determine the compliance by shoreline landowners with this turtle excluder regulation baywide and in the coastal bays. We wanted to find out if there was really any enforcement of this regulation by natural resource police. We wanted to find out what was going on at the bait shops. Did they provide these turtle excluders in these crab pots? Next slide. So our first objective, uh, we went out in August and September 2009 with the natural resource police. Um, the reason we went out that time of year is um, late in the year, many people have their crab pots up on their docks. They're trying to dry them out to get all the uh, algae and barnacles and stuff off them. <clears throat> and it makes it a lot easier to go up and, and view them right at the docks rather than have to pull them out of the water. But we did have the natural resource police with us because we actually did have to pull them out of the water in many cases. And we also had to get up on people's docks. And they had the legal authority to do that. Um, I myself did not, so we went with them. <clears throat> Next slide. In 2009, when we did this study, we used uh, four main study areas up here in Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, <coughs> on the Talbot Queen Anne County line, and out here in Worcester County. And here's where Radzio did his study. Next slide. <coughs> here's what we found. We found that about 22% of, of the crab pots we checked had the turtle excluders in them, only 22% of the um, of the um, 269 crab pots we checked on 432 docks. And if you notice, no one in Baltimore County, surprise, surprise, was, um, was in compliance. The Y River in Queen Anne's Talbot County had semi-good compliance and the rest was poor. Next slide. We also uh, took an independent sample. Um, the Natural Resource Police in Worcester County in the Coastal Bays 
had confiscated about 120 recreational crab pots. We went and they had them all piled up in the yard uh, there by their office. We went through that whole big pile and checked them for turtle excluders and only 18.3% of them had turtle excluders. So here we have three different studies, three di uh, two studies plus an independent sample all showed the same thing, really low public compliance with this BRD regulation. So that was 2009, next slide. So we also wanted to look at enforcement. So we queried, back, back then there was a database, uh, a natural resource police database that you could query. And we looked at six years, we wanted to see the preceding six years, how many written warnings and citations were issued and only one, had been, one citation and 37 written warnings. We also interview, interviewed a bunch of natural resource police officers. They considered this a fairly low priority regulation among the thick regulation book they had. Um, they felt it was difficult to determine crab pot ownership because the crab pots were at the end of, end of people's docks. They didn't know if it was a weekend or rental properties. So there was a lot of that. And then there was a certain stigma associated with issuing a turtle citation. There was a lot of peer pressure. In fact, the one officer who issued that one citation um, got a lot of uh, razzing um, from her fellow officers. So anyways, enforcement was, was clearly inadequate. Next slide. Then we, then we went and looked at the bait shops. Uh, we developed a database of Maryland bait shops through the internet. We did phone surveys. We had 75 respondents, which is about 68% of the bait shops in the state, which is pretty darn good. And that we were asked if they sold crab pots and BRDs. Next slide. And, and um, a few other things about, about the BRDs. Uh, what we ended up finding out that um, while 78% of, of the, of the um, 41 sites that uh, crab, uh, excuse me, uh, bait shops that sold crab pots, um, about 78% of them sold both crab pots and BRDs, but only 17% of those actually had the turtle excluders installed. So when the public was buying crab pots, assuming they were legal, only 17% of them were actually legal. So we concluded that we needed to better educate bait shops and the customers and get them to sell uh, the crab pots with the, with the turtle excluders installed. The survey itself was good because um, it got um, some uh, communication going between us and bait shops. And also the preceding survey with the natural resource police also began a dialogue with them on uh, enforce, that we thought it was important that they enforce the regulations on turtle excluders. Uh, we also talked to bait shops about distributing a brochure on turtle excluders. Next slide. So the recommendations from uh, the 2009 uh, and the conclusions study were that public compliance was low, enforcement was inadequate, but we saw bait shops as a critical opportunity for increasing compliance. And we really needed to require uh, the turtle excluders on all recreational crab pots sold. Unfortunately, we took that question to the attorney general, assistant attorney general, and we were told that DNR does not have the statutory authority uh, for commerce to control commerce. And so we did not have the legal authority to require those be sold with them on them, which is unfortunate. But um, I'll let the lawyers fight that one out. We then began an outreach effort to the public, the natural resource police in reach to them and the bait shops and we decided to follow up with a second compliance study in 2012, and then a third compliance study in 2016. Next slide. Oh, you went in the wrong direction. There we go. So subsequent actions, we held meetings with natural resource police. We found out that this was a low priority from them. They suggested we ban the gear type and recreation, we, we ban this gear type by recreational crab pots, which is uh, unfortunately uh, politically untenable um, position to take, even though it, it, it would be a, an easy fix. Um, and they suggested that DNR amend crab pot regulations to require the name and address of the owner on each pot. And we also talked to them about better training their officers on BRD regulations, which did happen in the academy. Um, this, this sheet at the bottom of the uh, screen uh, was uh, given to all the natural resource police, and they were, they were um, schooled on this regulation as well as others. Um, eventually, a regulation did get passed on the crab uh, on the owners of the crab pots uh, being on the crab pot too. Next slide, please. 
And through the Maryland Dimeback Terrapin Working Group, which uh, started in 2008 and, and uh, died in about 2018 or 2017, through that working group and a Maryland Herb Education Working Group, we produced this, um, this brochure. Um, the uh, National Aquarium in Baltimore did a lot of the layout work and a lot of the design work for this, so I really want to thank them in particular. Um, but this, this uh, was, was made available both online and uh, to bait shops. Next slide. We also, uh, on our website, we really had it front and center, attention crabbers, uh, letting them know that they really needed to have um, these turtle excluders on their crab pots. Next slide. And also in the fishing guide, the same thing. Next slide. And the National Aquarium in Baltimore also put together this great video, which is available on their website, which I think it still is. Um, Jack Cover's on, so he can confirm that later on, but on how to install a, um, a, a turtle excluder or a BRD in a crab pot. Next slide. And lastly, we put together this, this handout that went in all the bait shops in the state that would allow us to put it in there that lists where they can get um, turtle excluders and uh, we were hoping that some of the bait shops that did not uh, sell them would take this kind of as a as a way to start putting them on their on their crab pots. Next slide. And then we changed the Code of Maryland Regulations COMAR, which down here in red, um, we required them to register. Oh, oh this is a, a change that occurred a little bit later. We found that the name and address wasn't working. So um, DNR has been going to for both fishing and hunting licenses that everybody gets issued a DNR ID. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a fisher and a hunter, so I have a, a DNR ID that's with me. Um, it's a number I have that's there for the rest of my life. And if I were to uh, start crabbing off docks, if I, if I were so lucky as to own a, a water site property, um, I would have to put that DNR ID either on my crab pots, the floats, or at the end of my dock to show that I um, legally um, am uh, fishing those those crab pots, you need a permit now, but it's a free permit. I um, mean, you can get it online. Uh, next slide. So we decided we needed to go back. After we did all these things, we decided we needed to go back out into nature in 2012 and again in 2016. And we were supposed to do it in 2020, but I'll get to that in a bit, to see how things were going. Is the public really changing their behavior? Um, is all this outreach and inreach working? Is increased enforcement happening and is it working? And so we added three new study sites and they're the green diamonds on there. One in Calvert County on the, on the Patuxent near where Radzio did his work. One in Dorchester County in the Honga River area and one down in Somerset County near Crisfield. And we kept our other four uh, study sites. So now we have seven areas uh, throughout the Chesapeake Bay and the Coastal Bays that we're gonna monitor in both 2012 and 2016 for compliance. Next slide. So we really wanted to find out, are, they, are the landowners uh, using crab pots that have turtle excluders, one in each funnel? Are they, do they have the DNR ID somewhere on their uh, dock or on the float or on the, on the crab pot itself? And the law also has stated forever that you're only allowed two crab pots um, in your, uh, to be used. Um, and uh, we wanted to see if, if people were following that compliance. And we also wanted to continue this positive dialogue with the Natural Resource Police. Being out there for a day on a boat with these officers, you really had a, a lot of time to really get to know them and talk with them. And they got to understand how important this was to, to us anyways, and how we felt it should be part of their jobs. Next, next slide. So the methods, we followed the same methods as we did in 2009. Uh, we checked all the crab pots, uh, we checked the funnels, we counted the pots, and we interacted with the landowners. One of the things we did is we put together these packets, which are up in the upper left-hand corner, that were these packets that were the, um, were the brochure on how to, uh, why, why these uh, turtle excluders are needed and how to install them in a crab pot. And we included four turtle excluders and things for attaching them to the crab pot. We gave these away as we ran into landowners. And if the landowners, particularly if they're elderly or had some, some kind of handicap, we went ahead and actually outfitted their crab pots right then with the turtle excluders. 
Um, and landowners really like that. Um, they also save themselves a lot of money. Um, I do have a case of these in my, in my office right now, just to say that. Next slide. So here's the results. And, and these are the three different years, 2009, 2012, and 2016. And as you can see, the numbers that are encircled, <coughs> at each study site, we saw a trending increase in compliance with the uh, regulation. Next slide, please. <coughs> and if we look at a summary of that, uh, if we look at all the all the BRDs, we checked um, by the last year we were checking um, the last two years we checked over 700 pots at over um, 800 to 900 uh, docks, and we saw an increase in the last year we did this at 46.7 percent of all crab pots had the turtle excluders. One problem we notice is the next figure there, the 6.7 percent. These are crab pots that are getting older, and we find that the metal uh, turtle excluders rust out. And so landowners often don't um, keep their, their uh, turtle, uh, excuse me, their crab pots um, up to snuff. And, and uh, luckily, they replace them when things start to go, go bad. But we found that the, the turtle excluders actually uh, disintegrate at a faster rate than the crab pot does. So that's a, a problem if it's a metal crab pot. The other thing we found is that almost no compliance with the DNR ID. 5.7% of the pots had, um, or, or, the, or the docs had the DNR ID. And lastly, and this is the thing that is really awful um, in many ways, is that uh, consistently 20% or more of the docs were fishing more than two pots. And so that's a pretty easy uh, enforceable thing. People, uh, we had some, uh, a couple of people were fishing eight, eight pots, you know, some people just didn't seem to know the regulations. Um, anyway, so we did see some enforcement actions based on that. Next, next slide. So con con conclusions, public compliance with the BRD regulation is increasing um, from 20.8% in 2009 to 46.7% in 2016. I would say that's still awful. That's still not good enough. I would be happy with maybe 80, 85%. I could live with that. I can't live with 46%. Um, Pot registry and, and, and DNR ID compliance is low. The public is still unaware of this. Um, the number of pots per doc, uh, the legal number of pots per doc is awful. It's greater than 20%. That really is a, is a, a major enforcement issue. <coughs> and we need to address all this through outreach and through inreach. We may need to address the way the metal uh, turtle excluders um, disintegrate rapidly in salt water. Next slide. <coughs> uh, one thing we did in 2016, rather than call up the bait shops, we decided to visit them. And one thing we discovered really quickly was hardware stores sell as many crab pots as anywhere as bait shops do, perhaps more. So we put together a, um, <coughs> so we decided we needed to visit all the, all the crab pots and, and the hardware stores that we could in the state. We needed to figure out how many of them were selling crab pots uh, with, with turtle excluders and how many weren't and kind of establish a dialogue. Next slide. <coughs> we did an internet search for uh, bait shops. We physically visited the bait shops. We filled out a data sheet. We conduct surveys at additional businesses while we were driving around. Someone would tell us, oh, there's a bait shop over there that sells them and et cetera. So, uh, we eventually surveyed a large percentage of the bait shops and hardware stores in the state of Maryland that sell crab pots. Next slide. <clears throat> so we identified 120 stores to survey. We physically surveyed 92 of them. Uh, 52 of those sold recreational crab pots. And then we developed this ranking system for the, um, for the, for the stores. I'm not actually going to go into the ranking system. Um, let's just move on to the next slide. The key point I want to bring out here is at the bottom, the summary. Um, about 77% of the stores sold at least some crab pots with, with turtle excluders installed. So that was good. I mean, that was a good thing. And of course, this is in 2016. Um, and, and a little bit over half of the stores sold uh, turtle excluders separately. So if someone wanted to retrofit an older crab pot that didn't have turtle excluders, they, they were available. They could buy them. Uh, next slide. This is kind of how it looked um, with that um, scoring system with the blue being 
the best compliance followed by green and and the, the with the um, <clears throat> red being the, the, the no compliance. And also these percentages are <clears throat> the different study sites in 2016, what percentage of crab pots uh, had turtle excluders on them. So you can see the area that had the best is that Calvert County area. And, and that's primarily because there was one extremely zealous natural resource policeman who was a young guy who was confiscating um, crab pots that were not in compliance. He eventually got stopped from doing that because they ran out of places to store uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, crab pots that he'd confiscated. And there was a lot of complaints about that, but it was effective. I mean, he showed that enforcement is effective. It is an effective thing if you can convince the natural resource policemen to take this seriously and do it. And as you can see in the coastal bays, only 34%. And that's where, really where we have some really high use in the summertime of crabbers, um, a lot of transient, a lot of folks that aren't Maryland residents or they're only for a weekend or for a week or whatever. Um, and then of course, uh, things got worse as we went up the bay. Next slide. So we were supposed to go out this year and do this again and, and hopefully see things uh, even better than they were. <clears throat> but most of our field work got canceled due to COVID-19 as just about everything else stopped um, all over the all over the country. And so um, we, we really weren't able to do that this year. So next slide. So what are our next steps? We, we plan as long as uh, hopefully this COVID will be under control by next uh, August. And I'm hoping it'll be under control early, earlier than then. But by next August, we're, we're hoping to get out with the Natural Resource Police and go survey all those sites again um, and continue that dialogue with the Natural Resource Police. We do need to update our bait shop handout. Uh, we, need to, we do need to do some continued dialogue with bait shops. Uh, DNR Fisheries was supposed to have sent a letter out to all the bait shops last year. Unfortunately, the person who is doing that retired um, and didn't let us know they were retiring. Um, and because that's a different unit than I work for, there was there's some in internal DNR uh, communication problems that need to be uh, dealt with. Um, and lastly, we do need to publish this study to reach a larger audience um, and make it more aware. I think um, getting it published will, will add a little bit more um, impetus to, uh, to the study and make people take it a little bit more seriously that this really is a problem. But this is a low hanging fruit from a conservation standpoint, uh, stopping uh, developments and things like that, really, really hard to deal with. This is just a little device on a crab pot that will save a lot of terrapins. Next slide. So what can you do? I really think that there is a huge role for the public in changing this behavior. And um, as we saw with the ban on commercial harvest of terrapins in Maryland, it, was, it wasn't DNR, it was the public. It was concerned citizens that raised a big stink about it and were the ones that got the legislature to change this. So what I would love to see is a group of people to work, uh, say, hey, we really want to champion this. It's an easy, easy fix. Let's get people to take this seriously. They're, they don't, when people buy a crab pot, they don't know that it, if it doesn't have a BRD on it, they don't know that they're illegal. And so we really need to put pressure on the hardware stores and bait shops to understand that they have a moral obligation to the citizens of Maryland to make sure they're selling crab pots with turtle excluders on. So, um, you know, alert your family and friends. I mean, I think the, 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 uh, the, the Herp Club uh, would be a great thing to take on. And many of you are parts of other uh, conservation organizations and other groups. Think about taking this on as, um, as a conservation uh, effort. It's low hanging fruit, it's easy. Um, it should be easy. Of course, put it, wearing a mask should have been easy and that hasn't been easy. So, you know, this is all about human behavior. Um, carrot and stick and the, the enforcement and the things is we need, we, I, I need to work more with natural resource police and really, uh, again, put more pressure on them to enforce this. And so that's the stick. But the carrot is, su is such a much better way to do this. I think most people would do the right thing if they knew. And it's just a matter of, of doing this outreach. Um, next slide, please. 
So now I am open up to questions. And the very last slide is uh, information on my, uh, if you want to contact me, we could just put that last slide up. And if you, if you can't, that's okay. And I, so the next slide after that, there we go. Plus, a, that's a really handsome terrapin. <laughs> that's one we caught out of, in Somerset County, and I, I just, it was such a beautiful little girl. Um, actually, it was a male, come to think of it. Um, but he was blushing. So there's my contact information. Um, and now we can open this up to questions. I can't hear you. <laughs> I need to unmute myself. You can oh, you can go ahead and unmute and um, ask a question to to Scott. I have a question to start us off. Is um, have you how how will you see if the you know the effort to um, increase the use of the BRDs as and how it affects terrapin populations. So is there a concurrent um, study going on in terms of the population growth or decline as this as this <clears throat> effort moves forward? Well, we do have some we do have some population studies going on. There's a couple of population studies going on in different parts of the state. Not necessarily right where we're doing the um, the doc checks. Um, but for instance, there's been a on Poplar Island in Talbot County, there's been a long term population monitoring study going on there. Um, I have a long-term population monitoring study going on in Somerset County, uh, down near Frenchtown, uh, um, north of Crisfield, in that area there in a pretty remote area. Um, oops. Oh, someone wants me to start my video. Okay, I'll start my video. There we go. Now you can see me. Um, um, so that there are uh, there are a couple of different and there's a, a, a Patuxent Naval Air Base. Their their biologists there have actually been monitoring their terrapin population. And I, um, there's a oh uh, the Terrapin Institute there in, in uh, Talbot County is also doing some monitoring. I'm not I'm not sure what kind of data they're getting. So there are a number of different monitoring programs going on on out there um, to look at what's happening with the population. So we know that the population has decreased in the western shore. We know that the Patuxent River population has decreased dramatically. Um, but the lower shore, those populations actually are fairly robust. The population I'm studying in Somerset County is ginormous. I mean, it really is enormous. Um, the, 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 uh, the population in Talbot County that Willem Rosenberg is studying out of Poplar Island is also really large, and it's probably a source population for other areas. The things we don't know, because of predation, we don't know how, um, so island populations are gonna do pretty well for terrapins because of mammalian predators are generally not, not gonna be there. Um, and that's why Poplar Island has been such a phenomenal place for terrapins. Um, the questions we don't know are, are predators on the mainland populations of terrapins where they're nesting. Are those nesting grounds basically just feeding raccoons and there, there's no successful reproduction going on? Those are some questions we don't know the answer to, um, and that's something we need to find out. Okay. Next question. I had a question. I thought it was interesting when you were talking about the temperature uh, impacting the sex of the uh, turtles and the impact of global warming up here in the what would have been the cooler climate. How does that translate into the southern areas where it's always been warmer than that in terms of the uh, the sex ratio. So, so there are, there are beaches we call female beaches and there are male beaches. There are certain areas that the, the nesting situation is more shaded than other areas. And so traditionally there have always been uh, some beaches that produce more females than males and vice versa. Um, but what could happen, and, and we, we know this is happening in North Africa with some other species, um, that soil temperatures can get so high that you have embryo death. <coughs> Excuse me. There's also the mitigating um, circumstance of the differential mortality in crab pods. <coughs> you have to, excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Um, 
the um, the small size of the funnel opening in the crab pot only allows that excludes females, mature females from getting in the crab pots. <coughs> so crab pots tend to just drown juveniles and males. So you have these two different things. You have global climate change and the crab pots um, affecting females. And the only offsetting thing is, is um, road strikes and boat strikes hitting females, but that's probably much less frequency than what's going on with the crab pots. Corrine, you had a question. <coughs> I'm sorry, I had to unmute my phone and it takes a minute for the voice to say, you are unmuted. Can you all hear me? Now okay? we know your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you should text me, Scott. I have great <laughs> there ideas you for- <laughs> I have you great go. ideas for public, public outreach for- I knew um, you would, I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so in the chat box, I was saying, suggesting that the Meaningful Watershed Educational Experiences, which is a requirement for schools, you know, has an action phase for all the students who go out and they do these field investigations and understand our coastal communities better. And um, they love terrapins. I mean, there's terrapins in their, you know, stories that they get when they're in, in elementary school, and they get to raise terrapins in elementary school and middle school. And right, right, the Head Starting the Program. School, right. Yeah, and by the time they're in high school, they're all about the turf football team, you know, and they're really, you know, a big fan of Maryland sports. And I think that there's <coughs> some great, um, great opportunities for engagement with schools to get some outreach and public, you know, public service messages and things. And kids are so creative and they're so happy to get good grades based on a project that, you know, they, they do on something that they really are passionate about or love, like turtles. And, and terrapins. And so I think that there's um, an untapped um, resource in spreading the news about uh, turtle excluder devices through students. I would also say, I would love to see a data visualization at a Maryland football game of the percent <laughs> of turtles who make it from one field end zone to the other end zone, um, you know, based on the fact that they got excluded from a trap, you know, like, they made, they made it from one end to the other because the turtle excluder device prevented them from getting into a distracted area where they drown. Like, <laughs> show some kind of cool data visualization where they have a bunch of, you know, dressed up terrapin masks. I don't know. I mean, I'll talk to people at Maryland for you if you want me to. I don't know who that is, but I'll figure it out. And we'll, we'll find a nice way to do some really creative, very um, high profile public results of your study. I think there's some fun ways that we can do that to get a lot of the word out. And um, yeah, not just doing a white paper or a study for academics or for management. Great, great. Now I agree with you. In fact, yeah. you know, th that, ban that ban on commercial harvest of terrapins, I mean, I know, I know people like Jack Covers, who's on this call, did a lot of work on that, but it seems like the kids going to the legislature is really what pushed everybody. I mean, <clears throat> who, wants to, who wants to make a kid you know, look at you like you're evil, you know? Um, I mean, kids kids can really, uh, they reach our hearts. And, and I think uh, through the, the kids bringing the message is a really good way to do it. So yeah, I, yeah. I'd love to work with you on that. Um, you have some skills I don't have. So uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind go. of a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> you keep taking me out in the field and I'll help you with your, your messaging. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> I, I think it would be fun. I mean, we could easily have some kind of display um, at the at the Natural History Society too, don't you think so, Patty? Mm. You're muted. <laughs> the Master Naturalist could also um, promote that <clears throat> along the bay. Now that we know about it, it is such a, such a, um, well, no, we're not going to, are people going to shoot us if we go onto their docks and start looking at their, <laughs> their, their well, see, see, yeah, so you guys can't really do that. That's why I had the natural resource, I can't do that either. The natural resource police have to be with me. And, and we even with them twice, we got threatened to be shot. And even though the natural resource police is right there. So, um, you know, it's, I would not want any, any volunteers to be doing that kind of thing. Right. Um, well, people could be like uh, in a, in front of a bait shop with an educational outreach. Oh, yeah, table, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. Well, I, I think you need to give the bait shop an opportunity to change their behavior. I think most bait shops, I mean, I talked to the people in these bait shops. They were 
completely unaware of any regulation like that in many cases. Maybe one, one person working there was, but the, the, you know, a lot of the folks who worked there, they had no idea. So really, it's, this is an educational thing. It really, I, I think this is a solvable problem with education. Hmm. Any other questions about uh, turtles, about football, about crabs? <laughs> I have a quick one. Sure. Hi, Scott. This is Jim Barsley. Hey, Jim. Um, how you doing? Good. Uh, so I question for you in, in ecology, I guess, I guess the way to put this is, you know, the, the ratio to male to female isn't necessarily one to one, if assuming right. that the male can mate with more than one female. Have you seen in your research and in, in population biology, um, how low the male population can go before it becomes detrimental? No, uh, we, we don't know that. We, we don't know if we don't know if females are um, <clears throat> getting to the point where they're not being bred. Um, the one thing we do. So when we capture when we capture turtles, we palpate all the females to find out if they're gravid. And we can look at the percentage of them that are gravid to give us a rough idea about how many are, are, are producing eggs. But, you know, this is a species that produces three clutches a year. Um, and. You you're, you're assume that you're going to find females that are gravid at some point in the year, depending on when you're sampling. <coughs> but you're right. In nature, we assume a one-to-one -one ratio. But in a species where males can breed with as many females as they can, <coughs> having too many females is not a big, as big a problem as having too many males. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to excuse my, my coughing here. I'm I, I did get uh, tested for COVID a couple days ago, but I'm I'm hoping this is just a cold. Um, anyways, but you're right. You're right, Jim. Uh, sex ratios don't have to be one to one in nature, particularly with turtles that are polygamous. Um, mm -hmm. hmm. Was there any uh, another question you had as part of that? Or? No, I was just curious because I. When I was at Penn State, I was studying the gypsy moth, and you, when Union Carbide came out with the uh, <coughs> and attracted all the male gypsy moths to the traps, and they thought, "Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to, you know, get ahead of the problem." It only took one male moth to mate with all the females that were that were uh, right. in a particular right. area, so it didn't work. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't view, uh, yeah, I don't view terrapins as a pest, but um, you know. Right, right. I would say from a conservation standpoint, we'd be a lot worse shape if the sex ratio was shifted in the completely other direction. No doubt about it. I mean, right. it, you know, it's, but you'd still rather see it closer to 50-50. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my study area, depending on the year I was studying, it was somewhere between four and nine to one. You know, and there could, it could have been the way, it could have been uh, some bias in the way we're kept capturing the turtles. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Because uh, we were going out with a waterman and it was a bank traps. It's like a, a silt fence in the water or, or a drift fence in the water. Anything that's in the within 100 feet of shore, you're catching fish, crab, turtle, otter, whatever you're catching. Right, right. Scott, um, quick question. Oh my gosh, and I, I just <laughs> the question just flew out of my brain. The answer is Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what was the question? It was a good question, too. I mean, give me a second. I'll come back and somebody else ask a question. <laughs> this might be silly, but don't people, I, I only have ever went crabbing once and we used chicken necks for bait. Is that what people put in their pots for bait or they just put anything in there? I was thinking maybe you, grocery stores would agree to put a little mm -hmm. sticker, save the terrapin with a website <laughs> on chicken neck packs. <laughs> well, actually they, uh, bull, bull lips and um, bunker, uh, Menhaden are the two big things that okay. people in the know use. I don't I mean, know. You can, use, you can use chicken neck, sure, but that, then you're a chicken necker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just brainstorming. <laughs> So Scott, I, I remembered my question. It's, it's in terms of going back to the beginning of your presentation and building a better mouse trap. Is there are we just set into the crab trap that we have because it is the 
crab mm. trap that we have, or is there a crab trap that could even be better in terms of crabs and, and better in terms of excluding um, turtles from the from the start instead of red well, Yeah, Willem, Willem Rosenberg has built, a, he developed 15, 20 years ago, a, a crab pot that was like a big chimney that the top of it came out of the water, no matter what the tide was, so the turtles would always have access to air. But think about it, it's, it's really big, you know? I mean, it's, it's this big, tall thing. Um, you know, it just, I, I don't think it had any traction. Um, there's, there's a lot of different designs of crab pots. That the picture I showed of the classic crab pot, that has two chambers, an upper and a lower. There's a lot of recreational crab pots you see that are just one chamber. And they're, they, they come in all these chartreuse colors. These, they're, they're, um, they're metal core with, um, they're dipped in plastic. And they use brightly colored plastic, like purple and orange and red. And people say, oh, I want to buy that. It's so neat. And, um, but th those still kill turtles. I mean, there's, you know, there's nothing about them. But is there, a, is there another, another design that could be used? Have at it. You know, I'm not an engineer. Maybe someone who's got that engineer. Um, Willem Rosenberg tried something. They still, are, they still use them out at Poplar sometimes. They're these tall chimney uh, pots. But... Um, they would be really expensive. They'd be like three or four times the, the, the cost of a regular uh, crab pot. So there's <clears throat> there's the, the cheapskate part of human behavior. Um, people are always looking for a deal. Um, and I'm just trying to think of what else. Um, I think you got the engineering teams at University of Maryland on this. Maybe they could. There you go. Build there a, you go. Build a better, build a better crab pot. Build and, a better crab pot. And the, <clears throat> the cheaper, better for the turtles and, and catching more crabs. Mm -hmm. or, or ban the gear type and people can only chicken neck and, and you know and, and use those collapsible traps that, that are open open on the top um, and take away that one way of uh, one of the problems we have is there's a lot of weekend people so when they leave <clears throat> when they leave Sunday night they throw their crab pot off the end of their dock their crab pots they don't come back till the following Friday and when they pull up that crab pot there could be some dead terrapins in it I know some folks on the Y River who said they, they used to find those, but now they don't find them dead anymore because they don't see terrapins anymore. <laughs> so uh, anyways, um, that is a problem. Um, when we were pulling those crab pots, sometimes they were, they were cemented into the bottom. I actually injured my back a few times because they'd been left for so long or they'd been in the water for so long that they, they had a whole ecosystem of uh, algae and barnacles and shellfish on them that they weighed like 150 pounds. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people have thrown them out. And then there's ghost pots, which I forgot to talk about. These are derelict pots. These are pots that uh, someone came along with their motorboat and their propeller sliced the rope and the pot is now adrift. It's, it's on the bottom and it's still catching and killing things, but no one's picking it up. And so ghost pots are a real issue. And there, there have been a number of efforts over the last decade to remove ghost pots from the bay and there's been some F, uh, some estimates of how many ghost pots are um, are deposited every year, and it's a pretty large it's a pretty large number. Um, so really, there needs to be an annual effort. And there have been some efforts to actually have um, watermen in the winter time when they need something to make some money if they're not oystering if they're not catching oysters um, to pay them to use side scanning sonar and go out and find these ghost pots. Um, there, that's been done in both the coastal bays. And in the, in the main stem of the bay, it hasn't really been done in the tributaries though, which is really the mouth of the tributaries is probably the, the, the area that really needs to be focused on um, and collect those, those crab pots. Other questions? All right, well, I'd like to thank you all very much for having me tonight. I hope, uh, mm -hmm. hope you found this educational and I hope I didn't make too many mistakes. <laughs> Well, thanks, Scott. Yeah. I, I'm looking around. Everybody seems smarter, and they're also more energized, and they're also, they're, more importantly, they're empowered with education to go out, and they can, we can do something with this knowledge. So, mm -hmm. I think that that's that's very exciting, especially during this 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 time of this strange time that we're living in, where we feel, um, you know, kind of uh, sequestered. I feel everybody was brain was going and coming up with some ideas to really uh, tackle this problem. So it was kind of exciting to have that um, be part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. 
and I'm going to be trying to design a new crab pot over the winter when I'm. And you're going to become rich. <laughs> that's that's the goal, and I'll donate the money to the Natural History Society of America. <laughs> and I, I have a name for it: the Bronwyn Special. Okay. <laughs> um, Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Stay safe. I hope to see you all at an upcoming program. Uh, buy a raffle ticket for yourself and for somebody else. And if you need some, uh, some ideas for Thanksgiving dinner, tune in on Tuesday night for entomoph entomophagy. It's my new word, and it's hard to say. Um, good night, everybody. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Did Scott leave? Scott, oh. Scott? Scott? You're muted too, Patty. Can you see me? Yeah, I can All see right. you. Now I can hear you. All right. Scott? Too funny. Oh, well. Desi's there. <laughs>